Okay, welcome to lecture three. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about uh, the skeletal system. So we'll be talking about the different types of cells that we have within the bones. Um, we'll be talking about different classifications of bones based on their structure, what they look like, and then also um, the internal components as well. Um, so what actually makes up the inside of the bone. So we'll be talking about the difference between spongy bone and compact bone as well. So the skeletal system contains 206 bones, and these bones can be subdivided into axial and appendicular um, skeletons. So the axial skeleton, we're talking about um, your thoracic cavity, so like the, the middle part of you, um, the vertebral column, and also the skull. So the axial skeleton is made up of, like I said, um, the vertebral column, the thoracic cavity, and the skull, and the appendicular skeleton is made up of your appendages, so your arms and legs, basically. And we'll give you a, a little bit more detailed um, description of, of these skeletons here a little bit later in the lecture. Um, pound for pound, our bones are actually three times stronger than concrete. Um, so our bones are very, very um, strong in nature, and this will be important for us as we start to look at some of the functions of the bones. So five major functions of the bones. Um, the first is support. So bones provide a framework to support the weight of the body. And again, um, you know, without the bones, we would kind of just be a big blob of something. Um, so the bones are going to kind of provide us with a scaffolding um, to support the weight of the body and also um, all the other organs of the body as well. Um, movement. Function number two is movement. So skeletal muscles are going to attach to our bones, and these bones are going to act as levers to move the body and its parts. Okay, so in order for a muscle to um, have any type of action or have any type of movement occurring, it needs to cross a joint. And so it's really going to have, most likely have a connection on one bone and then have its other connection on a different bone. And again, as the muscle contracts, this will allow those bones to act as levers and this will allow us to have some movement occurring. Um, function number three is protection. Um, so our bones are going to play an important role for protection of our vital organs. And if we want to think about which bones does this actually involve, um, if you think about which organs are the most vital to us and how we can protect them, um, the skull would be one. The skull is going to play in a very essential role in protecting our brain, which we could questionably consider the, you know, the most important organ in your body. Um, also the thoracic ca cavity, so your rib cage um, is going to play an important role of protection. And the rib cage will play an important role for protecting our heart and our lungs. Okay. Um, function number four with the skeletal system is mineral storage. Um, the minerals that we're most specifically concerned with in the skeletal system are calcium and phosphate. And so the storage bin for both of these um, two essential minerals will be inside of the bones. So calcium and phosphate or mineral storage is number four. Number five, um, this is something that might be kind of new to you or surprising to you, but the skeletal system plays a very important role in blood cell formation and also energy production. So within the red bone marrow, um, which is kind of on the internal, I guess the internal area of most of your long bones, and again, we'll talk about this in more detail here a little later, but within the red bone marrow, we can produce um, blood cells. And within the yellow bone marrow, we can store energy. And the type of energy that we'll store within our bones is actually fat. Um, so those are two, I guess, interesting um, components of the skeletal system that most of us don't commonly think about. Okay. So again, to review, the five functions of the skeletal system include support, movement, protection, mineral storage, and lastly, blood cell formation and energy storage. Okay, if we take a look at the bone tissue, so we're looking at what's going on 
um, inside of the tissue itself. And again, um, we said that a tissue, if you remember back to um, lecture two, that a tissue is made up of cells and some sort of extracellular matrix. And we talk, talked briefly about um, bone being a particular um, unique type of tissue. And so we're going to talk in a little bit more detail in this lecture about what actually is going on within the tissue itself. So first thing we have is an extracellular matrix. And our extracellular matrix within the bone tissue contains a large amount of collagen fibers. Um, again, remember back to that tissue lecture that we talked about three different types of fibers. And we said that the collagen fibers are the, the strongest of the three. And these collagen fibers within the bone kind of act like steel rods. And this is what really gives the bone its innate strength. Okay, so you've got all these um, steel rods. Again, you can see each of these long strands here is a collagen fiber. And again, this is what's going to provide us with the greatest amount of strength um, or the basis of the strength within our bones itself. Um, also within the bone tissue, we have three different types of cells. Um, they are all osteo um, cells. So osteo means bone. Um, site means cell, so we have osteocytes, which would be bone cells, um, and within the osteocytes we can subdivide these even a little bit further down and talk about um, specifically what types of osteocytes that we have. And there are two, um, I guess, special function types of osteocytes within the bone tissue, um, osteoblasts and osteoclasts. An osteoblast is a builder, so an osteoblast is going to build up bone tissue. So the job of an osteoblast is to create more and to help us to build bones. Osteoclasts are the tear downers, you could say. So their job is to destroy different parts of the bone. Okay, um, the bone is actually a very dynamic type of tissue, so we constantly have the balance of our osteoblasts, which are our builders, and our osteoclasts, which are the destroyers, we could say. Um, so in order for us to maintain our bone um, strength and our bone mineral density, um, we need to make sure we are matching the activity level of our osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Um, again, bone tissue contains those cells that we talked about. We talked about three different types of cells, so osteoblast, osteoclast, osteocytes, um, and also this extracellular matrix. Um, within the bone tissue itself, we have both organic and inorganic components. So our inorganic components include mineral salts, and this is what actually makes the, the bones hard. Um, and we also have organic um, components as well. And this includes the cells, the fibers, and the ground substance. And again, that ground substance um, plays a really important role, I guess, in um, producing an extracellular matrix that is conducive to um, that particular type of tissue. Okay, so if we talk about these um, mineral salts, within the extracellular matrix. It's mainly made up of calcium phosphate. And again, we said um, these are the two important minerals that we are going to store within the bones. Again, um, if you wanted to think about bone in comparison to concrete, because we did say that they are both very strong in nature, you could think of the collagen fibers as kind of like steel rods within that. And then the mineral salts are going to act um, like sand and rock in the concrete. Okay, um, So mineral salts are going to help the bone to remain hard. So this, I always think of this or I always remember this. If you think about like if you've ever made homemade ice cream, um, one thing you do is you can put some like salt um, in the outside portion of like whatever the ice cream maker is. And again, that helps to um, make the ice cream hard in nature. That's kind of the same idea with these mineral salts within the bone. The mineral salts are going to help the bone to remain hard um, if we remove mineral salts. So for example, if we like took a bone, like let's say we took like a chicken leg or something and we soaked it in a weak acid, which would help us to remove those mineral salts. 
um, the bone would become very soft and we could actually tie it in a knot. Um, so again, you can see how important it is for us in terms of maintaining the level of calcium and phosphate that we have within the bone in terms of, um, you know, maintaining our bone strength. Okay, so we've made mention of these three types of cells. Um, the osteoblasts, again, are going to build. Osteoclasts um, are the carnivores or the killers of the bone tissue. And the osteocytes are um, just maintaining normal, I guess, normal functioning within the, within the bone itself. And you can also see where they're located within the bone. So the osteocytes are buried within the bone itself. And the osteoblasts and osteoclasts are located on the ex um, A couple other thing I, things I forgot to mention with the um, three types of bone cells that we have. Um, osteoblasts, again, are bone forming. They form both organic components. They also form the ground substance, and they also can produce collagen as well. Our osteocytes, their job is to keep the bone matrix healthy, and the osteoclasts are going to, again, break down and reabsorb the bony matrix. Okay, so now let's have a look at the microscopic structure of compact bone. And if we were to subdivide our bones into um, two different, I guess, types, we have both a compact bone and a spongy bone. So first thing we'll do is take a look at the compact bone. Um, as you can imagine, the compact bone is much more dense in nature, whereas the spongy bone is going to be a little bit lighter and make up the interior portion of a lot of different um, bones that we have. So within the compact bone, we have what's called an osteon or a haversion system. Okay, the osteon or haversion system is, system is a long cylinder, basically. So if you wanted to think about the strength of the bone, you could imagine an osteon or a haversion system as one single pillar. So each of these osteons um, is equivalent to one single pillar. Within each of the osteon, we have several different layers or lamellae or what those are called. Um, so if you think about this in terms of like a tree, um, if you were to chop down a tree and you could see each of the like rings within the tree and that tells you like how old the tree is, um, each of those layers we could compare to the lamellae of the inside of a bone. Okay, so each individual layer within one single osteon is called a lamellae. Okay, so many layers um, within each osteon. Also, we have a central canal or haversion canal. Let's see, we can see that here. And this is like a hole that runs through the center of each osteon. And this is gonna be important for us because it's gonna allow us to um, carry blood and also um, nerves through the bone. So we have um, an artery and a vein and a nerve that are gonna flow through this central canal or this haversion canal that we've mentioned. We also have periphrating or Volkmann's canals. Okay, we can see those over here. And these are gonna help us to connect blood vessels and nerves throughout the whole bone. So they're gonna kinda of go um, transversely <clears throat> Um, and kind of cut through the sides here and allow us to connect um, each kind of bundle of artery, vein, and nerve to each other. So we are um, able to connect those blood vessels and nerves throughout the entire bone. Um, the last component of um, the compact bone that we'd like to make mention of is the periosteum. Okay, periosteum is here. And periosteum is a connective tissue, tissue lining. Um, peri means around, osteum means bone, so it goes around the bone. Okay, so um, the periosteum is a lining of connective tissue that lines the entire bone.
Okay, so here we're looking at a histological slide or histological image of what um, compact bone would look like underneath a microscope. And again, here you can see the osteon or haversion system. Um, a couple other things that we can see. We can see these lamellae, which again we said were the layers that are going to make up that osteon itself. Um, and you, over here you can see the haversion canal in the middle. And again, that's where we're going to allow um, arteries, veins, and nerves to flow through and to be able to um, provide communication and deliver nutrients and pick up waste products within the bone. Again, do keep in mind that the bone is an active type of tissue. Um, osteocytes, again, we said these are the bone cells that are located within the bone. Um, and each of these little black spots is an osteocyte. And um, around them, they have what's called a lacunae. And the word lacunae means little lake. And this is kind of cool. So the lacunae acts like a little, it's like a little, um, you could think of it as like a little cave or a little lake, I guess. Um, but its job is to um, serve as a little opening in order for that cell to stay there and live. So the lacunae, or our little lakes, um, each lacunae is going to serve as like a little den for each individual cell. Okay, so here's another histological slide. So we're looking at um, this just zoomed in a little bit closer. Again, you can see the osteocytes are each of these little black dots, the lacunae or the little lakes in which the osteocytes reside. You can think of it as like their little den, that's where they live, um, surround the osteocyte. And then we also have um, what's called lamellae. Oh, we already talked about the lamellae. Those are the layers um, that make up the cell. Here's your reversion canal in the middle. Um, the other component that I want to mention here is called canaliculi. So it's C-A-N-A-L-I-C-U-L-I, -I, canaliculi. And what this mean, what it means is little canal. And each of these like little spidery legs that you see um, represents the canaliculi. Okay. Um, again, little canals. Um, or spider legs that are kind of protruding from each of the lacunae. And the job of these um, little spider-like legs, or these canaliculi, um, is to allow the cell to interact with each other. Okay, so um, again, because of the, the way the tissue is very um, brittle and hard, it's difficult for our cells to be able to move around within the tissue itself. So they're kind of stuck in place. They're stuck in their little lacunae. They don't get to leave. And they can send signals to each other. They can communicate with each other um, through these canaliculi. So again, the purpose of these spider-like legs is to provide us with um, our ability to interact with another cell. Okay. So now we've talked in some detail about what's going on at the microscopic level um, to form our compact bone. Again, we've talked about the osteons, we've talked about the haversion system, um, we've talked about the canaliculi, we talked about lacunae and the osteocytes and all the components that are involved with the compact bone. Again, surrounding the compact bone, we said, was the periosteum, and that's a connective tissue covering um, that's going to surround the whole outside of the bone, basically. Um, compact bone looks solid to the naked eye, but again, under a microscope, um, we can see those passageways for nerves and blood vessels, and again, we called those the haversion systems. Um, and it's located superficially when you compare it to the spongy bone. So again, you see the compact bones kind of like around the outside of the bone, and then we have spongy bone that makes up the middle portion here. Okay. Um, the difference in terms of the microscopic view of compact bone when compared to spongy bone is, guess what? Spongy bone is much more spongy. It's much less dense. It's much lighter, um, which is important for us in terms of 
um, being able to move. If all of our bones were filled in with compact bone, it would be nearly impossible for us to even move because it, we would be so heavy um, because of the density of the bones. So the spongy bone interior portion allows our bones to um, be relatively lightweight and this is going to help us to um, be able to complete any type of movements that we need to complete. So here you can see under a microscope what spongy bone looks like. Again, they're basically like just these really big air bubbles or air pockets um, kind of all throughout the, the bone itself. Okay, so again, we talked about the beginning of this lecture um, that we have both an axial and appendicular skeleton. Um, so here we're going to kind of identify which bones fall into which category. So again, we said the axial skeleton, um, which you can see here in kind of this bluish color, is made up of basically the thoracic area, also your vertebral column, and your skull. Okay, um, So you can see the bones that are included in the axial skeleton include the cranium, vertebral column, ribs, sternum and hyoid bone and the hyoid bone is kind of like a little bone that um, sits right underneath your skull pretty much it's not um, shown in this picture but again i'll repeat that one more time cranium vertebral column ribs sternum and hyoid bone are what makes up the axial skeleton um, again the appendicular skeleton which you can see here in kind of the yellowish color are made up of the appendages okay um, so it's composed of the arms, legs, and the pectoral girdle. So the pectoral girdle includes um, the scapula and clavicle. So here's the clavicle here. So those are also included in the appendicular skeleton. And also the pelvic girdle. Okay, so you can see your pelvic bones here. And then also all of your appendages. So arms, legs, fingers, toes. Um, and why would it be important for us to classify um, the bones based on their location? Um, again, this can help us to understand what their function is. Um, this will also be important for us when we start looking at the different muscles that we have. Um, many of our muscles are going to attach, have one point of attachment somewhere on the axial skeleton and then another point of attachment on the appendicular skeleton. And again, um, just classifying our bones based on location can help us to understand their function um, and help us to just have a better understanding of um, their relationship to the muscles and their relationship to movement as well. So understanding these will become important for us a little bit later in this course. Okay, we can also classify our bones based on their structure, what they actually look like. So we have long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, and a sesamoid bone. Okay, so long bones um, basically has a shaft and it has two distinct ends. Um, several examples of long bones that we have <clears throat> within the body. Um, fingers are one example. So each of the individual components of the fingers are a long bone. Um, also the arm and leg bones. So here is an arm bone. You can see the leg bones are very long. They have a shaft and two distinct ends. So those are all classified as long bones. Um, our short bones are generally cube shaped. Um, the main locations that we have short bones are going to be carpal bones. So we've got eight bones located in the wrist. And then we also have eight bones located in the ankles as well. So our carpal and tarsal bones so the carpal bones are the wrist bones and tarsal bones are the ankle bones and those are all short or cube shaped in nature. Our flat bones um, can be flat, they can also be curved. Um, a couple examples of what we would consider flat bones, um, the skull is one example, our ribs are considered flat bones, um, the sternum which is here and the scapula, which again is kind of your shoulder blade bone on the backside. Those are all considered flat bones. So flat bones, skull, ribs, sternum, and scapula. 
Um, irregular bones, these don't necessarily fit into any other category. Um, they're kind of just odd shaped. Some examples of our irregular bones include the vertebrae. So again, you can see that it doesn't really fit into any of the other categories. Also, the hips um, don't necessarily fit into any other category, so we can consider them irregular in nature. A sesamoid bone um, is considered a type of short bone. It's supposedly shaped like a sesame seed, um, which I guess I don't necessarily see that connection. I don't think that um, this example of short bone or a sesame sesamoid bone looks like a sesame seed, but that's okay. Um, so this, the only example of this that we have within the body is the patella. And the patella is the kneecap here. And again, it's supposed to, supposedly sesamoid shaped in nature. Okay, um, more bony features that we have. So here are the bony features that I'm going to define for you. And I have an image on the next slide that I'm going to go ahead and flip to as I describe these items for you. But make sure that you do know the definitions for each of these terms. And again, I'll be explaining those on the next slide. Okay, so let's start with the diaphysis. Okay, so the diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. You can see that is located here. And then we also have the epiphyses. Okay, so epiphyses are the ends of the bones. So each long bone would have two epiphyses. So here you can see the distal epiphyses, and here you can see the proximal epiphyses. Those are just the ends of the bone. We also have an epiphyseal plate or epiphyseal line. So that's located here. And this is a disc of hyaline cartilage, and this is where our growth plate takes place. Um, again, once you're done growing, this plate kind of um, closes up. But for an adolescent child, um, this would be the area of active growth. We have cancellous or trabicular bone. I'm trying to see which is the same thing as spongy bone. Okay, so it's listed here as spongy bone. So again, it is um, it kind of makes up the interior portion of our, of our long bones. Um, it has open spaces that can be filled with red or um, yellow bone marrow. Again, the job of red bone marrow is production of blood cells and yellow bone marrow um, is going to play an important role for us in terms of fat storage. Okay, so we've got the red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow as well. Um, medullary cavity, okay, we can see here um, the interior shaft of the bone, and this again is filled with yellow bone marrow. Okay, and again, that will allow us to store um, some amount of fat actually within the bones. Okay, we have an endosteum, you can see here. Um, that's within the bone. It's an internal bone covering. It's made up of connective tissue, and again, its job is just protection, pretty much. Um, then we also have a periosteum. Again, peri means around. Let's see if it's listed here. Here we go. Periosteum. Um, peri means around. Osteum means bone, so this surrounds the bone, um, covers the outer surface of the bone, with the exception of the cartilage ends. Um, again, its job is to help us with protection. So the endosteum lies interior, um, the periosteum lies on the exterior portion of the bone. It's the most outer layer. Okay, um, last term to define on this slide would be the articular cartilage, um, also known as hyaline cartilage. And again, if you remember back to your tissues lecture, we know that hyaline cartilage covers the ends of the bones. Um, this allows for kind of a smooth covering, and this will allow us to easily have an interaction with another bone um, and allow these bones to kind of glide against each other without causing us a whole lot of pain. Okay, so that's called articular cartilage, also called hyaline cartilage. Okay. Um, again, like we've mentioned, um, contrary to, I guess, popular belief, 
our bones are very dynamic organs and they're very co like constantly remodeling. And again, we said that was due to the um, activity level of both the spongy bone and, or I'm sorry, due to the activity level of both the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Um, so we're constantly remodeling our bone, constantly getting rid of old parts and replacing it with new. So bone is deposited and removed primarily from the endosteal surface. So again, that's going to be the most outer surface. So all this activity level is occurring kind of on the exterior surface, you could say. Um, our spongy bone, which we said was going to make up the interior portion of the bone, is replaced every three to four years. And our compact bone is completely replaced every 10 years. Um, and again, this is going to involve the interaction of both the osteoclasts, who tear things down, and the osteoblasts, who build things up. Okay. So in terms of repairing bone fractures, if we said that, you know, normal life, normal people are going to replace their spongy bone every three to four years, and we're going to replace our compact bone every 10 years, uh, we know that if we get some sort of fracture, um, it doesn't take that long to recover, thankfully. Um, we can have a much quicker recovery process than that. And the repair of bone fractures is going to involve really four different steps. So the first, uh, hematoma formation. And this is where blood vessels are going to break where there was a fracture. And this will cause a large amount of inflammation. Okay. Um, step number two, fibrocartilaginous callus is formed. So um, osteoblasts are going to enter into the area and they're going to fill it with a soft callus or kind of like a softer tissue, you could say. It's not as strong as bone, but it's going to be stronger than um, it's going to be stronger than just, you know, having this hematoma formation. And this is made of dense connective tissue. OK, so that's step number two. So we form kind of like a cartilage callus. Um, within this particular area. Step number three, within one week, um, trabicula begin to form. We create spongy bone and also a hard callus. So again, um, spongy bone is going to be formed. Now we're turning that soft callus into a hard callus um, almost within one week. So that's step number three. And number four, over many months, the bone is remodeled and compact bone is eventually going to take over um, and we'll have that healed fracture. So again, that could take, you know, several months. You might remain in a cast for eight weeks or something along those lines um, until that we feel comfortable that um, the bone is kind of set in its particular position. So again, I'll review these one more time for you. Um, first thing that happens when you have a fracture is a hematoma formation. So basically you get a flooding of um, blood vessels in the area and this causes a bunch of inflammation. This inflammation is, is caused in part, we could say, by a bunch of blood rushing to the area. Okay, second thing that happens, we start to form a soft callus and osteoblasts again are going to enter into the area and start to make this type of um, tissue that's Stronger than blood, but not as strong as bone. It's kind of like a soft cartilage. Um, step number three, within one week, we start to create a spongy bone and more of a hard um, callus, basically. And then lastly, step number four, um, over many months, the bone will continue to be remodeled and compact bone will take over this particular um, hard callus that we had created initially. In terms of bone disorders, um, several bone disorders that we'll make mention of. The first is osteoporosis. Um, this is one of, I would say, the biggest skeletal issues that we have in this country. And osteoporosis um, technically means, osteo means bone, poros means porous and condition so bone porous condition so basically we have a change in the um, amount of pores within the spongy bone itself so you can see with osteoporosis the pores become much larger in comparison to um, a normal bone matrix okay so we have a decrease in the density of spongy bone 
the bone becomes much more porous. So the pores become larger, the bone becomes lighter. Um, as we decrease our bone mineral density, this will increase our risk of having fractures. Again, you can see that this tissue would be much easier for us to break apart in comparison to this tissue. And that has to do with the size of those pores or the size of those holes. Okay. Um, again, one thing I do want to mention in terms of osteoporosis that I kind of forgot to mention on the previous slide, um, what are the causes of osteoporosis? This is something I think we should understand. Um, generally, it has to do with an um, inefficient amount of calcium intake. Okay, so we have a decrease in calcium consumption. Um, again, if you remember back to our conversation about those uh, mineral salts, if we don't have enough calcium within the bones, this can cause the bones to become more weak. Um, they become more porous. And again, this can lead to an increased risk of um, fractures. Um, the important thing to note about calcium intake and osteoporosis, so you got to think about it in terms of like a bank account. So you have this bank account for storage of calcium within your bones. As a child and as a teenager, um, we can put as much into that storage bank as possible. So it's important for us at those particular ages to be putting in um, calcium into your calcium storage account within your bones. Um, by the time you reach the age, I believe it's 25, um, that storage or that savings account shuts down. Okay, You can um, maintain the level that you have, but you cannot build up any greater amount of savings after the age of 25. So it's very important for us to make sure, ladies in particular, that we are getting enough calcium um, before you reach that age of 25 because this is something that will be delayed and affect you later in life. Um, so therefore it's important for us again to kind of get that calcium storage bin filled up um, before your savings account closes. Okay, um, moving on to rickets disease. Um, this is an, a common issue that we see in our country, um, but this is most common in third world countries. And rickets disease, also known as osteomalacia, is known as soft bones. And this is caused by a vitamin D deficiency, can also be caused by calcium or phosphorus deficiency. And the way in which we can cure this issue is um, exposing the skin to sunlight and also drinking vitamin D fortified milk. Um, so one thing that's, I guess, unique about the way in which we absorb calcium um, is vitamin D kind of acts as like a, he acts as like a gatekeeper to allow us to um, store calcium. So if we drink or if we intake vitamin D and calcium together, it allows us to get more calcium absorbed, which is why a lot of like dairy products that you can intake are high or they're fortified with vitamin D because again, it's gonna help us to increase the amount of calcium absorption that we have. Um, so again, this is this is pretty common um, issue in third world countries, not necessarily something that we see here in our country. Okay, Paget's disease is characterized by excessive rates of bone deposition and bone reabsorption. And this makes the bones soft and weak because they're um, being remodeled too quickly and there's not enough stability within these particular bones. Um, and you can see here that this can cause the, the bones to become kind of bowed um, and um, cause some kind of bone deform, can cause the bones to be a little bit deformed possibly as a result. Okay. Um, just a brief couple slides on cartilage. Again, this should be a review from lecture number two. Um, cartilage is far more abundant in the embryo than it is in the adults. Um, as part of fetal development and development in general, um, cartilage is replaced by bone tissue. So this is something that's kind of happening from um, fetal development all the way through early adulthood. Again, we mentioned that we have three different types of Cartilage, we have hyaline cartilage, 
which is the most abundant type of cartilage, holds the most water. Um, this tissue resists compression very well, and thus it's important for us because it covers bone ends um, as articular cartilage. Also um, helps us to attach our ribs to the sternum as well. So those are kind of the functions of the hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage um, is considered elastic because it contains more elastic fibers. And um, this makes up the outer portion of the ear. Um, again, a higher amount of elastic fibers will make the, the cartilage more elastic or stretchy in nature. And lastly, fibrocartilage. Again, we said this is very strong in nature. Um, contains a high amount of fibrous proteins. Um, where is it located? Um, it makes up the intervertebral discs. So it's located between each of our vertebrae. And it also makes up the menisci of the knee. And it will also make up the pubic symphysis. So again, the pubic symphysis is going to connect um, the two pelvis bones together and hold those two in place and allow for very little movement at that particular joint. Oh, I didn't realize I had all these on actual slides, but this is all the information I just said. Um, Highline cartilage, again, is the most abundant, um, holds a large amount of water, and its main location would be covering each of the bone ends. Also helps us to connect the ribs to the sternum. Elastic cartilage, again, we said was found in the outer ear, also found in the epiglottis. Um, contains collagen fibers, but is most prominent type of fiber is going to be elastic. And again, if you touch your outer ear, you know that you can manipulate it and move it all around and it will return back to its original resting position. And that's due to that elastic recoil of the elastic fibers. Fibrocartilage, again, very strong in nature and it can resist um, a lot of compression and a lot of pulling forces. Um, where is this located? Um, again, between the vertebrae, also the pubic symphysis, and then the menisci of the knees.